I'm going to tell you about tonight is a journey into uh, a really fascinating topic for me. Uh, so I used to study mushrooms. I used to wander around the forest searching for mushrooms. You know, remember um, Mario Brothers, the red mushroom with the white dots on it? That was my PhD. I studied that for five, five years of my life. Um, and at the end of that, I was really excited about fungi and I thought that was really great, but I was looking for something that was a little bit more relatable, something that people could um, connect to in a way. And I always love cheese. I always love fermented foods. I always love food in general. Um, and fortunately, someone was looking for uh, a microbiologist, someone who knew something about fungi, uh, to work on this project. And the rest is history. Here I am uh, talking about fermented foods. I'll be talking about cheese. So let's get started. One of my favorite places to go in the city uh, of Boston or in, in Cambridge is Formaggio Kitchen. How many people have been to Formaggio? Probably most or many. OK, great. We have a lot of cheese lovers here. Um, now, of course, we all love to go there because it's delicious. You can spend a lot of money there in a very short amount of time on many delightful foods. Um, and of course, as you peer into the counters that they have there with all the beautiful signage and all the diverse styles of cheeses, um, it's kind of overwhelming, actually, right? There's a lot to see there. There's a lot of different types of cheeses to see there. And for me, as a microbiologist, it's really overwhelming because it's kind of like peering out into a galaxy. <laughs> for me, when I look at that cheese counter and I see all those different colors and I smell all different smells and taste all those different flavors, it's like going out and exploring our galaxies because each of those individual cheeses, each wheel of cheese, each slice of cheese is its own planet, its own microbial planet. Just like planet Earth is crawling with people and plants and animals and, and lots of different things in different places, that wheel of cheese is crawling with millions of microbial cells. It's covered just like a planet with life. And for most of us, for, for you included, I assume unless you have a high-powered microscope at home, um, generally speaking, you, you can hold that wheel of cheese that Blumierine Camembert, or that you know, Stilton, or that uh, delightful Loire Valley goat's cheese. And you can hold it really close to your eye, and you can see the fuzziness, or you can see the colors, right? You can sort of see that there's something there. But you're sort of stuck almost as if you were sort of flying over the city of Boston or you know, Boston Harbor in an airplane or a blimp or a helicopter where you, you could tell that there's variation across space, right? You can sort of see there's Logan. I mean, we know it's Logan. Uh, you can kind of see there's Cambridge and there's some water. And so you can see there's variation. But first of all, you don't know how terrible the drivers are in Boston by just flying over, right? Uh, you don't know how bad last winter was. Um, you don't know. Where does the sewer flow in? Or where are the streets? Which way is a one-way versus a two-way street? You don't know that because you're not able to get at that level of detail in this aerial view. Um, so what I'm hoping to do tonight is tell you a little bit about what happens when you zoom in at the microscopic level. So what we're doing here, it's that same surface of the cheese. But what we're doing is we're zooming in and we're seeing individual cells, all those individual creatures living on that wheel of cheese. So here's some fungi, these giant blobs here, are some fungi that are growing here. These are all bacteria. And this is with an electron microscope. So we're zooming in to two micrometers, right? So this distance right here is two uh, micrometers. And that would be like walking through Harvard Square on a busy festival day where you can actually see that detail. You can hear what people are talking about. You can see what people are eating. And this level of detail, these microbes that we're looking at are the microbiome. So this is a collection of microbes in a particular environment. So the wheel of cheese that we're talking about tonight, that has a microbiome. The bottom of these chairs, they have a microbiome, right? The, the, between my toes, there's a microbiome there. Everything has a microbiome because microbes are everywhere. And we're talking about a particular environment. We're here talking about the cheese microbiome. We could be talking about the Harvard Square microbiome. And what I'm interested in is the microbiome. What generates the diversity that we see in that microbiome? Um, why do we have particular microbes in a, in a particular place, just like we have people in a particular part of Boston? And microbiomes are everywhere. They're essential for life. If we didn't have microbiomes on this planet, we would be in big trouble. Um, so, for example, out in the ocean, there are microbes everywhere, and there are microbiomes on everything. They drive nutrient cycling on our planet. They make things, energy flow across our planet. We find really cool and useful chemicals from microbes growing out in the ocean, for example, that are great for pharmaceuticals. 
Um, you may have heard about this mine uh, disaster out in the west where they released all that pollution into the rivers. There are microbes actively working on those pollutants right now to help break them down because microbes are everywhere and these microbiomes are really important for us. Um, microbiomes are important in food production. If we didn't have microbes living in our food systems, we wouldn't be able to go out there and have a nice dinner, right? We wouldn't be able to drink the wine or beer that you're enjoying tonight. Microbes can kill plants. They actually can be really bad for plants and they can you know, wipe out a whole cornfield. But there's a lot of work going on right now. Um, a whole bunch of big agricultural companies are spending a lot of money to study the microbiomes of our agricultural systems to understand how we can increase plant productivity. And of course, as I said already, uh, we all have our own microbiomes. You all came tonight with a whole zoo of microbes and every microbiome in this room is different. Not every person has the same microbial community living between your toes or living in your gut or living up your nose. Um, and they're important for us. They help us digest food. They can train our immune systems. And we're learning all kinds of new things about uh, the nuances of these microbiomes. And of course, they can also cause disease. Not all microbes are good. Usually we hear about bad microbes and I usually just talk about the good ones. Um, another really fascinating thing about microbiomes is that they are variable in diversity. So I love this picture because it's very close to home. This is a human body and we're looking at microbiomes across a human body. So just on the surface, we're not looking at stuff inside. And don't worry about all the crazy names like uh, Firmicutes or Staphylococcaceae. I know that's microbiology terminology. Just look at the, the colors right here. And each of these pie graphs represents a different body site. So for example, uh, this pie graph right here is talking about the microbiome on the palm of your hand. This pie graph down here is between your toes and this one is uh, between your nose. And of course you can see each of these pie graphs has different colors and those different colors represent different microbes. So you can very clearly see that your nose has a lot of these blue colors, a lot of these types of bacteria, versus um, on the palm of your hand you see a lot more of these green bacteria. And that's just a great example that microbial diversity is highly variable, even in your own body. So, the challenge and, and the big sort of question that we ask in my lab is why, right? Why do we each have our own microbiomes? Why is your nose microbiome different between your toe, uh, from your toe microbiome? And it's a lot like asking questions. You're just sitting around people watching, which I do a lot when I'm not in the lab looking at microbes. It's more refreshing to look at things you can actually see very easily. You can ask yourself, why are people in Harvard Square? Why are there a lot of students? Well, obviously there's Harvard there and there's MIT down here, but you, know, you can sit around and ask what de generates diversity in communities. You can ask the same question about the microbiome. Another question we ask as, as microbiologists in this area is how do microbiomes assemble? So just like on a assembly line to produce a car, you need to put those wheels on at the right place in that assembly line Otherwise, you're not going to make a great car, right? If you put the rear view mirror on where the axle should go, things are not going to go well, right? You're not going to have a very functional car. And the same thing um, can be true of microbiomes. How are the microbiomes in our guts that help us digest food, how do we get those microbes? How do they change over time? How do they disassemble? Another thing we ask, and this is a great, I love the analogy of having uh, neighbors, human neighbors. Uh, how do your neighbors affect what you do? How do you interact with your neighbors? So, Maybe some of you have a really annoying upstairs neighbor who stomps really loudly, you know, and so they don't generate a positive energy in your house. They pro probably generate a lot of negative energy. There are microbes that fight with each other, right? There are microbes that are antagonistic with one another. But there are also examples where maybe your neighbor needs some sugar or maybe you're going to help them rake their leaves and, and help them out. And the same thing is true within our microbiomes. There are examples of microbes positively affecting one another. And that's really exciting and something that we're trying to figure out. And finally, you know, one of the reasons we're doing all this work, it's not just fun to ask basic science questions, but we want to know how to improve life and improve the human condition. And so we want to be able to understand these questions of, for example, assembly of microbiomes so that we can help human health or we can help um, agriculture. Now, the one thing I want to say, and we're going to get to the cheese in a second, is that despite all kinds of new technologies, despite all the stuff we got from the Human Genome Project, where we got all this crazy DNA sequencing technology, and despite all of our massive computers that can crunch numbers really, really quickly, it's still really, really hard to dissect a microbiome. 
it's really hard, for example, to get a sample of your gut microbiome. Why is that? Well, it's hard to get to your gut, right? It's not an easy place to just grab a sample and go. You, there's a lot of complicated stuff I'm not going to talk about right now, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of microbiomes are not accessible. A lot of microbiomes are really complex. Hundreds, if not thousands, of species living together. And so you can imagine trying to dissect a system where there's so many moving parts, really daunting task. Um, and so, you know, one way to deal with that um, is something that scientists have been doing a lot of um, history of science, is to use a model organism. So a lot of what we know about human biology, for example, we know from the lab rat or from fruit flies. Now, obviously, these are not humans. You know, there's a lot of differences between us and that cute little rat up there, or mouse. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, and it's a simple system. We can grow a ton of mice in a small space and do things to them and learn about how biology works. And for us, you know, people use fruit flies and, and small plants and rats, and what we use are fermented foods. So our model system are all these foods that we enjoy that are delicious in various ways and are covered with their own microbiome. And so you may be thinking, well, why fermented foods of all things on the planet um, as something to study? Uh, well, first of all, they're beautiful and delicious. You know, that's a great advantage for us when we're done with our experiments. Sometimes we can eat them. Um, <laughs> you can't do that with a mouse unless you're crazy. I don't know. Um, but you can eat. Um, these wonderful accessible things. That's, that's the first thing that's great. But um, from a scientific perspective, they're really accessible. Again, you don't have to do a lot to just scrape a sample off of a wheel of camembert. It's right there. I can go over to Formaggio Kitchen. I don't have to trompse around like I used to back in the day, a forest when it's like 108 degrees and there's rattlesnakes and spiders and I have to wear all kinds of gear. I just go to a cheese cave, right? And I buy my sample from the cheesemaker. It's much easier. I love field work. If anyone's a field biologist, I'm not, um, I'm not dissing that. I love doing field work. But um, these are much more accessible than some other systems. Uh, they're reproducible. People have been making fermented foods for hundreds of years, right? We've been eating these delicious, cheeses and salamis and kimchi. We've been eating these things for many, many, many years, and people have been reproducibly making them. And reproducibility is a great thing for a scientist, right? You want to be able to see the same thing over and over again. Another important point for microbiology is that we can grow them. They're culturable. So if you go out and just take some soil from right outside here on the sidewalk, um, uh, right next to the sidewalk, and try to grow all the microbes that are there, there's probably hundreds of microbes, you won't be able to grow most of them because we don't know what those microbes need in order to grow. But when we make a cheese or when we make kombucha or kimchi, we, we're giving the microbes the food, right? We're giving them milk or we're giving them cabbage or we're giving them tea. And so we know exactly what they need to grow. So they're culturable and that's incredibly useful. And one other final thing I'll say is that um, it's easy to actually recreate these things in the lab. So we can make a little in vitro cheese. I'll actually pass around one of our in vitro cheeses later. We can actually really easily make these things. We don't need animal models. We don't need complicated permissions from the university. We just make cheese. It's really easy to do. Um, so that's actually quite powerful. Um, so what are the fermented foods we're actually studying and where do they come from? Well, salami. Uh, how many people have had delicious salamis before? Sort of traditional salami is great. Um, so salami is where you take meat, raw meat. It can be pork. It can be bison. It could be beef, whatever you really want to start off with, and you take that raw meat and you ferment it. You work with bacteria that produce acidity that preserve that raw meat. I'm not going to get into all of the details of salami production. You stuff it in a tube and age it for a long time. Um, but what's great for us is that then salamis are a microbial ecosystem. I, I love this photo of the surface of salami. Um, so what you're looking at here, that fuzzy white surface there, that's all mold. That's a fungus growing on the surface of that salami. And each of those little patches there, those are bacteria and yeast. Microbes living, it sort of looks like a lunar landscape, right? It, I think this is much prettier than Pluto, but whatever. Um, and this, you know, this is an example of one of these microbial ecosystems uh, that we can study. Uh, kombucha, how many people love kombucha, right? If you haven't tried it, I would, you know, I'm skeptical myself sometimes, but I've tried it and I love it. Kombucha is a tea that you ferment, and it's a really fascinating one. So you make some tea, and you stick it in a jar or crock or whatever you have, um, and you add this slimy layer of bacteria and yeast. And when you make your tea, you're adding some sugar to the kombucha, and what happens is that sugar is an energy source for the yeast. The yeast that are in there 
chug that sugar and they make alcohol, just like in wine production or in beer production. And then what happens next is the bacteria that are also there use the alcohol produced by the yeast to make this slimy mash. And when they do that, they're actually making acetic acid, which is vinegar. So when you drink kombucha, it tastes a little bit like alcohol sometimes and a little bit like vinegar. And that's because of the work of this bacterial and uh, yeast community that's living inside. This thing is incredibly popular. Um, and kimchi, which is another thing that we're working on in my lab, of course, is a fermented food. You take vegetables, uh, usually cabbage, usually something like Napa cabbage. You mix it up, uh, you, you uh, mash it up, and that releases sugars from the plant. The plant has natural sugars in it, and those sugars become available to the bacteria. And those bacteria munch away, and here's a picture of what the bacteria look like from our batches of kimchi, just tiny little blobs, um, nondescript, but they're really important. And they produce acidity, and that acidity preserves that kimchi. That's why when you, you either eat yogurt or you eat kimchi, there's that little bit of that zing as the best way that I have to describe it. That's the acidity produced by these bacteria, the billions of bacteria that live inside. So most of the work that we've done so far and most of this sort of diving into microbiomes and understanding what is a microbiome has been with cheese. So I'm going to talk about cheese, pretty cheese-centric tonight. But I'm happy to talk about some of our new projects that we just started. Um, I've only been at Tufts for a year, so we're sort of still coming online with some of these other projects. Um, so in particular, we're interested in cheese rinds. Um, so we're not talking about you know, plastic wrapped cheddar here. We're not talking about you know, craft singles. <laughs> Definitely not talking about craft singles. Uh, we're talking here about naturally aged cheeses. So these are cheeses that have been made for hundreds of years where you, you make a cheese, um, you make a solid mass of curd, and you put it on a shelf or you put it in some kind of aging environment and you grow what's called a rind. So when you do a cross section of these cheeses, what you see is this crust on the outside. And that crust is a mix of bacteria and fungi. It's a whole community, just like that picture of Harvard Square, but think microbes growing on the surface of your cheese. And what I love about these cheese rinds is they're so diverse. Just like you know, going out and seeing many different types of forests. Even in New England, you can see many different types of forests. All of the colors and textures you're seeing in these photos here are because of the microbes, because of the microbial communities, because of the microbiomes. So the orange color, that's not a dye. That's because a microbe is growing there. The white color and the uh, brown colors, those are all because of the growth of microbes on the surface. So if we zoom in and look a little closer, this is what I actually look at a lot in the lab. It's not as exciting. You know, I think it's much more exciting at this scale <laughs> than it is at this scale. Uh, and it is usually in black and white like this. Um, so what you're seeing here are some of the most common critters we have in fermented foods. So what we're seeing, these long tubes, these long filaments, those are molds. So probably you've let strawberries go too long or bread go too long. You grew that fuzzy stuff, mold. You maybe have it growing in your bathroom right now. Um, those are these tubes. It's like a subway system. It's like a network, just like a subway system is, where these microbes grow across the surface and in interconnected tubes across the cheese surface. A great moldy cheese is a camembert, really fuzzy white cheese. Um, some of these larger circles that you're seeing here, um, those are yeasts. So you don't really usually see signs of yeast growing on the cheese, uh, but they're there. And they're uh, in the same group of the molds. So they're both fungi, just like mushrooms are fungi. Um, but in this particular case, they're uh, these small little uh, circles. And over here, uh, we have some patches of bacteria. And these are the three major players that we have on cheese. We have mold and yeast, which are both fungi, and we have bacteria as well. And when you plate these things out in the lab, when you grow them on a Petri dish, which we do all the time, this is an example from a, a blue cheese, they're really beautiful. They're really gorgeous. So this is um, from a Robiola. Isn't that gorgeous? Um, this is from a cheese in the Pyrenees, and they kind of look like jellyfish. Those are actually bacterial colonies. Um, this is from a blue cheese. You get all these really exciting colors showing up in, in some mold. Um, this is from a cheese made in France, uh, Comté. So quickly, how do you make cheese? Where, where does cheese actually come from in order to grow these microbial communities and these microbiomes? Well, you have to first start off with milk. So all cheese starts off with milk. It can be cow, it can be sheep, it can be goat, it could be horse, it could be camel, depending on what part of the world you're in. And you make curd. So this is the first fermentation step. You add those lactic acid bacteria that we have in yogurt, that I talked about in kimchi or in um, salami as well. And they help acidify the curd and, and sort of break down the milk and make that liquid into a solid. 
um, with the addition of some other chemistry, which I won't go into tonight. And then once you have the solids, once you have the curds, um, what you do is you shape them into something, something interesting, a circle, a square, whatever you, ha you happen to be interested in. And then you salt the cheese. And the salting is for flavor. You know, of course, salt adds flavor to foods. But salting also helps control what microbes will grow on the cheese. It actually dictates what microbes can grow. And then finally, um, there's an aging step where you actually put the cheese in a cool space um, and let it age for a while. And if you don't remember anything from tonight, this is the one slide to remember to impress your friends at the next dinner party where you take a really awesome cheese plate, which you should do after tonight. Um, these are the three main styles of rinds that you'll see growing on the cheese. So there are bloomy rinds, which you have over there on the left. Those are fungusy, fungal, um, fuzzy cheeses like your camemberts and your breeze of the world. They're fairly simple. I like to think of them as sort of the highly manicured lawn. Um, they're heavily inoculated with a mold, so there's a lot of growth of penicillium, close relative to the thing that brought us penicillin. There is no penicillin in these cheeses, though, by the way. Um, and these bloom during the aging process. The mold actually grows and creates a fluffy mat, and that's where the name comes from. In the center there, we have these orange things. Those are the stinky foot cheeses of the world, right? How many people have smelled like a really gross cheese? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, sometimes farty cheeses, some people call them. Um, these are very potent, and that, again, the orange color comes from the growth of microbes on the surface of the cheese. It's thought to have been invented by monks who were, um, I guess, had a lot of time on their hands and were washing the surface of the cheese over and over again with a salty solution. And over time, they noticed that you get this really beautiful color, but you also get some really pronounced funky flavors that go along with those cheeses. And the final kind of rind that you can get is called a natural rind. And these are sort of um, uh, your sort of Tome de Savoise or your uh, St. Nectaires or cloth bound cheddars of the world. Those are the cheese when you walk into Formaggio and they're just sort of brown and mottled and look like a rock. Those are natural rind cheeses. And you don't really do very much during the aging of those cheeses. You just set them on the shelf and let them age over time. And rind development is beautiful. It's a, it's a really a cool thing to see if you can ever go into a cheese cave. Um, so on the, on the side over here, on the left, we actually have really young cheeses that have just come into the cave. And these bright orange cheeses are probably about 30 days old, and they have the rind developing on them. And the same thing is true for this blue cheese. This is a really young cheese, and we're actually looking forward into time about 60 days. Why go to all this work? <laughs> it seems like a pain, right? Um, it's delicious. It uh, you know, obviously tastes really good. It's also really beautiful. So you know, one of the things that you can do with a really cool rind is set your cheese apart. Right? When you walk up to that cheese counter, there's a bazillion different kinds of cheeses. Have something that's eye-catching. Um, so all the colors and textures you're seeing here are because of microbes. That bright orange on the Hudson flower there, that's a mold that someone is intentionally growing um, to make that cheese so interesting. Um, and to the point about flavor development, um, that's, of course, the main reason we're growing these microbes. And the title of my talk tonight, Delicious Rot, when you're growing these microbes on the surface, it's just like when you see a log rotting in the forest. The microbes are slowly rotting in a controlled way that cheese, right? They're breaking down the cheese, and they're releasing all these things that we perceive as delicious. So some days my lab smells like bananas, some days it smells like rotting socks, um, some days it smells like cabbage, and that's based on the different microbes that we may happen to be growing in our lab at that particular time. Okay, so that's Cheese 101, really quickly. Um, so back to in the last uh, sort of 10 minutes we have left uh, to talk about some slides. Um, I want to go back to these big questions and, you know, again, thinking about a community or a microbiome, um, what can we learn from cheese in terms of asking these questions? And what are we doing in the lab to dissect microbiomes using cheese? One of the first things we did, and I have to say it was the most fun that we've had, um, was to go out and sample a whole lot of cheese um, in North America as well as in Europe. So we sampled 137 different types of cheese. And from each cheese, we actually sampled multiple wheels, right? Because sometimes there can be variation within a cheese. We wanted to make sure we captured that because we're good scientists. Um, and we also wanted to have more cheese. Um, so we ate some of the cheese because we only care about the inside, right? We don't care about the outside, so we can eat that. Um, and it was very delicious. Uh, so we tried to sample across geographies. So we sampled Europe as well as um, all parts of America. And you can see, essentially, <laughs> right here, this is Vermont. We heavily sampled Vermont because there's a ton of great cheese right there. Um, and the other thing that we sampled across to understand the microbiomes of these cheeses was the type of rind that I just told you, the bloomy, the washed, and, and the natural rind. 
And I just really quickly want to tell you about you know, how to, when you hear the word microbiome in the news or when you talk to someone about it or if you, maybe if you read a paper, um, how do we measure microbial diversity? And I will tell you, it's sort of like what happens in CSI, right? When they're trying to figure out who did the crime, they take a DNA sample and they get a, back a hit and they tell you it was you know, Joe Schmo and he did it and they have it in a database. It's not that fast and it's definitely not that sexy. They make it look a lot better um, than we do in the lab. Um, in the lab, it's a very slow process. Um, it's a lot of work, um, but it's very similar. So we take DNA from a sample and we amplify up particular genes that can tell us what microbes are there. Just like at a crime scene, you amplify up particular genes that can tell you who was there committing the crime. And at the end of the day, you get back a whole bunch of data from a DNA sequencer. It's not after a day like I have on CSI. It's usually many weeks. Um, and uh, what you get is a lot of colorful data that gives you a list of all the different microbes that are present in your microbiome. This is being used for all kinds of samples. You could use the same approach in the soil. This is being used for the human, micro, uh, human microbiome project, so fecal samples or skin samples. Um, and we use the same approach for cheese. And I'm about to show you a lot of colors and it's a lot of data, but don't be overwhelmed. Um, this is a rainbow of cheese. So this is what we found. This is the big pattern of diversity that we saw across those 137 cheeses that we worked so hard to sample. So what I'm showing you here um, are two different types of data. The, the data on the top here, this top thing, those are for bacteria. And on the bottom here, we have our yeast and our molds, or the fungi. And all these different colors here represent different types. So think about it as if it was sort of like oaks versus maples versus pines in the plants. That's the level that we're thinking about here with the microbes. And each of the columns here represents a different cheese that we sampled. So as you look across this, you're looking across many different cheeses. And one of the first things you can see is that not all cheeses are the same, right? There's a lot of variation as you look across all these different cheeses. Um, and I don't have all uh, night to talk about the nuances of this, so I'm just going to put up a, a reference that you can look at later. Um, what I will tell you are some quick highlights that we learned from dissecting cheese microbiome. Uh, one thing is that the type of rind determines the microbiome diversity, which isn't surprising. Um, these cheesemakers are manipulating that rind, and so you end up growing different types of microbes. So for example, um, all of this diversity over here, the sort of red-colored bacteria in the scheme and, and this light green Fungus, um, those are all bloomy rind cheeses. There's a lot of camembert style cheeses in there um, that are quite interesting. One really big surprise, really big surprise for us and the cheesemakers is we found a lot of marine bacteria in cheeses. So what do I mean by that? These are bacteria that are almost always isolated from the ocean, never found on land. And so this is surprising because we're talking about cheeses made in Wisconsin, for example. There's no ocean <laughs> near Wisconsin. Um, and what's really cool, and we still are working on this, we're pretty sure that the sea salt that cheesemakers are using to make their cheeses, usually we think of salt as a killer of microbes. In this case, the sea salt is bringing the microbes from the ocean to the cheese plant and inoculating the cheeses, um, which is quite surprising. And these uh, microbes are not these are not dangerous uh, microbes, as far as we know. In fact, many of them produce a lot of really great flavors for these cheeses. Uh, and this is very surprising for the cheesemakers. Another really big surprise from us, uh, from a microbiological perspective, we found two types of bacteria that were never found on cheese before. Um, a huge amount of a couple of these Swiss Alpine style cheeses. A, a really great cheese, Hollerhocker, has a lot of these really cool bacteria on them. Never described in cheese before. And we wouldn't have known that unless we went out there with our CSI approach. Uh, one thing that we get a lot of questions about from people is, is there microbial terroir? Um, so just like in wine, you know, where different wines in different places taste unique um, because of something about the geography, the taste of place. Is that true for the microbes growing on these cheeses? And sadly, our data says no. Um, so here's a really great example. And you can just, again, look at the colors. We're not even looking at the microbial names. These are a couple of different cheeses that are very similar in terms of the microbes they have growing on them. But these are made in California, Vermont, France, and Wisconsin, right? Very different places. And so we like to say, if you build it, they will come. Um, so if you create the right environment in these cheeses, you'll end up growing the same kind of microbes. Now, there are many caveats there. We haven't killed microbial terroir. Um, you know, we're not talking about strains of microbes here. We're only talking about, like I said, the ma maples versus pines versus oaks. There's a lot of nuances there. So we're working on that in my lab and trying to better understand that right now. 
Um, and I just want to sort of skip over this because we're a little bit low on time and tell you a little bit about our in vitro cheeses. So, you know, one of the first questions was, um, what is the diversity? Now let's dissect the diversity and better understand what's going on inside of those microbiomes. And so what we do is we make in vitro cheeses. So I actually brought one of my favorite in vitro cheeses. Uh, as you pass this around, you smell a fart. It's not your neighbor, it's the cheese. Um, these are a little bit stinky. Um, it's totally, these are food safe, it's totally fine. Um, this is an, a 96 well plate, it's called. It's what microbiologists and biologists use often. And what you can see in there, there's different colors um, in these individual wells. Each well is filled with cheese and we can inoculate them with microbes. So you can imagine if there's 96 wells on one of those tiny plates, you can do thousands and thousands of mini cheese experiments in a day. You can process many of these. And so that's what we do in our lab. Um, this is a, an example of one of the experiments. This is microbial ward and piece. Um, so what we're doing here is we're working with various fungi that we've found um, and growing them with various bacteria and looking at what happens when those two things grow together. What kind of interaction is it? Is it positive? Do they help each other? Is it negative? Are they inhibiting each other? Um, and so we can do those experiments uh, pretty quickly in the lab and learn things about the nature of microbial interactions. And then once we find really cool interactions, we can do things like, I like to say we're the NSA of microbes, because um, we're tapping into that line of communication that's going on as these microbes are interacting with one another. So this is a, a really great example because it's very visual. So what happens in these, in these assays when we grow, there's a particular bacterium known as Arthrobacter. When we grow it by itself, the curd stays white. Um, and then there's a fungus, Penicillium. When we grow that by itself, the curd stays white. When you mix the two together, it turns pink. What is that? What is that compound? Why is it when they're growing together, they're making the cheese turn pink? And what's really cool is we do this in the lab, but cheesemakers see this all the time happening on their cheeses. And so um, what I'm showing you here, this is our NSA of microbes, uh, where we can collaborate with really great chemists that can look at the specific chemistry of what is going on when these two things are interacting. Um, so what we're looking at here, these are, are maps of various molecules that the fungi and bacteria are producing. So there's a, a fungus right here, and then there's a bacterium right here, and there's a particular compound um, that the bacterium is producing only when it's growing with the fungus. The bacterium's growing by itself over here, we don't have any of the compound, but when it's growing next to the fungus, it lights up with this particular thing. We don't know what it is yet, but that tells us there's some line of communication, some chemistry, just like when you chat with your neighbor, um, this is how these things are chatting with each other. And again, it's really easy to do this because it's a, an easily accessible system. Um, so I'm just gonna wind down the lecture -y part um, and tell you that the cheese producers are bringing together all these different microbes from uh, various places like the ocean, which was a big surprise for us, and create these delicious uh, Rhine microbial communities that we enjoy uh, as fermented foods. And what we're doing in the lab is we're bringing them in um, and working with them in these 96 well plates and, and using all these new technologies to sort of figure out what are the basic principles that drive these microbiomes. And it's useful to do that for the basic science, but we're, our goal is to then take this back out into more complex places like the ocean or the human microbiome and ask, are the same things happening out in these more complicated systems? So in addition to that, you know, along the way, we're learning some really useful things for cheesemakers, right? Um, so I will tell you that cheese making does not always go as it should. <laughs> so you see all the beautiful things, right? The, at the cheese shop, you never get to see the rejects. Um, but there are many things that don't go right for various reasons. And for a cheesemaker, this is loss. Uh, for a microbiologist, this is really cool because this is an opportunity for us to go in and understand why. Um, so this is an example of a rind that just stopped growing. This is a, a bald spot, essentially, on a cheese. Um, a lot of cheesemakers, again, this is something you never hear about, but there are weeds in cheesemaking. There are weedy fungi that try to invade and infect cheeses. And so a lot of cheesemakers spend a lot of their time trying to get rid of these weedy um, organisms. This is my coolest uh, Franken cheese example. Uh, this is a cheese we got sent to us. It was a purple cheese, a cheese that turned purple, which is not a typical color in cheese making. Um, and we had a really good time trying to be the CSI detectives of cheese to try to figure that one out. Um, so we can help cheesemakers that way. We're also working with folks like uh, the sellers at Jasper Hill up in Greensboro, Vermont. They have their own microbiology lab now. So we can go up there, position ourselves right next to the cheese and learn a lot about the cheese ecosystems and microbiomes that they have. 
Uh, another thing that we're kind of curious about, and this is ongoing work, is what does self of the stuff do to us, right? When we eat all these microbes, <laughs> which are active, they're still alive, uh, what's going on? Um, and there's some really fascinating work coming out of France right now and some other labs showing that a lot of the microbes living on cheeses, simple cheeses like camembert, have anti-inflammatory properties and they do actually really good things to your immune system. So we're learning more about that and, and working on that in our lab right now as well. And finally, I'll just uh, put another shout out for the fact that, <coughs> sorry, these systems are so great for teaching people about microbes. I mean, you all came here tonight. If this talk was called like E. coli basics, you know, you would never have been here. <laughs> no offense, E. coli is incredibly important. Um, but fermented foods offer this opportunity to get people excited about microbes in ways that they may not have been aware. So you can quickly get excited about a bowl of miso, right? Or a, a, a bowl of kimchi or a wheel of cheese. And then we can tell you all the cool facts about microbes. Um, so I write for Lucky Peach sometimes about microbes. I'm their microbial advocate, as they call me. Um, and we also have this website, it's slowly developing. Uh, I don't have a lot of free time anymore, but uh, microbialfoods.org, where we write about the science of fermented foods, everything from kimchi. It's not as cheese-centric as tonight, I promise. Um, and you can learn more about uh, some of the stuff we're doing there. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to sort of more general questions you may have about fermented foods, or maybe anything that I talked about tonight. Yeah, we're here. Are there short-lived and long-lived <coughs> microbiomes? Those are great questions. So I'll, I'll repeat the question for everyone, and then I'll uh, make sure we pass around the microphone. So um, the first question was, um, are there long-age and sort of short-age microbiomes? Uh, and the second question was, do microbiomes evolve over time? I'll get to the second one because we know actually more. Um, there's a great example from cheese making about how microbiomes evolve over time. So if you were eating a camembert, say, 200 years ago, it would be green. It would not be that pure white thing that we think of as camembert. And that's because uh, the mold that we're using uh, to make camembert now is a mutant. It evolved. It changed over time. So that color um, that you see in the green and blue molds that grow on your bread and rot your bread is the wild type, right? That's the molds out in nature look like that. But when you give them a sort of cozy environment in the lab or on cheese where there's a lot of food around, they sort of let go. They put on their sweatpants and have like a nice beer weekend. And they let things go. And they evolve. And so what we actually are doing in my lab right now are experiments to look at that process. And we see really quickly, within a couple generations, these mutants, white mutants, popping up from green molds. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of time. In terms of your short versus long age microbiomes, yes, some microbiomes grow really rapidly and sort of stop growth. Um, some of them are much sort of longer, and we actually see that in cheese making. Uh, some of the cheeses are really rapid to grow, and some of them you can see activity for two years in uh, as the cheese ages. Yeah? Okay, yes. sorry, hi. Um, I have two questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about, I don't know if you know anything about it, the mother in vinegars, which I've yeah. developed, and what that is. Yeah. Um, a very placental looking thing, I have to say. Yeah. And then the other, my other question is, I think I just read somewhere that there's a connection between gut microbiomes and psychiatric illnesses. I don't yes. know if you know anything, but whatever you can say. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, to your first question, the, the mother in vinegar is very similar to the mother in kombucha. So when you make kombucha, you add this slimy layer um, that slimy layer is actually mostly made up of cellulose, which at first is a little confusing, right? Because we think of cellulose as the building block of plants, not microbes. Um, but the particular microbe, you can see it here, it's, again, kind of cute, um, but very nondescript. Um, that's called acetobacter. Uh, acetobacter produces acetic acid, which is vinegar. And another thing that it produces is a lot of cellulose. So I call it the Spider-Man of microbes because it shoots out all these threads of cellulose and that builds this raft. It builds this floating layer. Um, and that's really useful for those microbes because they need oxygen. They actually need oxygen in order to do what they do. And you can imagine if you're at the bottom of this, um, you know, this particular container, there's not a lot of oxygen there. So they build these rafts in order to help support themselves. Your second question, I will actually start off with a warning about microbiome research and what you hear in the news. Be very, very, very skeptical of most of the things you hear in the news. Um, I will say that largely because this field, I mean, all of our stuff, don't be skeptical of, no. <laughs> um, 
the cheese stuff is very solid. No, uh, a lot of the studies in the human microbiome are difficult in a couple of ways. First of all, it's a very new field, right? So we learn one thing and rapidly we learn that actually there's a lot of nuances in studies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, second of all, a lot of the initial studies we have to do just because of the nature of science, um, we have to reduce it a lot. So I told you, you know, in some microbiomes they're so complex, there's hundreds of species there. And so studies like the one you just talked about, um, they're actually looking at one bacterial species, just one species inoculated, I think it was in a mouse, they were even doing this in a mouse. So you can imagine one bacterium in a mouse is very different than hundreds of bacteria in a human. So whether or not what they find in those mouse models will translate to us is something we still don't know. That said, people are also doing work where they look across humans that are just eating their normal food and taking their normal probiotics, and they do see some hints of various disease states. So you know, we hear a lot about Crohn's disease or irritable bowel syndrome, but even some um, things related to psychology, so mental illnesses, they are starting to see some interesting patterns, but we're so far away from knowing cause and effect there, right? Maybe if someone has a mental illness, they just don't eat certain kinds of foods for some reason, and that's driving what their microbiome is like. So again, so be very careful. All of this stuff that's coming out, it's, it's very new, we're, it's very fast changing field, and there's a lot of hype out there. Um, and part of the hype is also to get you to buy tons of probiotics, which <laughs> we can talk later about whether or not that's a good idea, but yeah. Yeah. So heat, um, I'm sure they react differently to uh, different temperatures. Mm -hmm. And in relation to what you were saying earlier about probiotics, uh, you know, they have, in yogurt, there are living cultures, right? Um, but once they make it to your stomach, will they still live? So there, again, is a great reason you should be very skeptical of many of the things you hear. Um, so a lot of the microbes that are sold as probiotics in food, so in yogurt, for example, they're not made to grow in your intestine and sort of stick to the inside of your stomach, right? If they were, they would make really bad yogurt. It would taste terrible, right? That, you know, that would be bad yogurt. They're designed, they're sort of selected to make really, really good yogurt. So when they get to your stomach, you have a whole slew of other microbes in there. So the, the chances that they're gonna stick to your stomach and, and figure out how to get in there and sort of stick around are very low. And so a lot of studies that actually look at when subjects consume foods with probiotics, with bacteria in them, um, they just see really rapid passaging of all those microbes through. So you'll eat a lot, you'll actually see signals in the DNA of all those microbes being there. As soon as you stop eating that food, that signal will disappear really quickly. So they're just sort of passing through. Now that said, um, when they're passing through, they could be doing a lot. They actually could be changing how your digestive tract works. Another caveat to that is if you have some uh, some particular disease or you know, you're taking a lot of antibiotics and you've wiped out all the microbes that you have living inside of your uh, digestive tract, it can be really good to have something like uh, foods with a lot of microbes in them, probiotic foods, um, because they can actually sort of fill in um, as your stomach resettles and it gets recolonized. And again though, we still, there's so many nuances there. Uh, each of you has a different gut microbiome, so you can imagine you're all gonna respond quite differently to something like just eating some yogurt. Um, so we still don't understand all those connections yet. Um, but yeah, be very skeptical. Even, even all the kombucha probiotic stuff. I love kombucha, I think it's a fascinating beverage. But as I said earlier, these things need oxygen, right? And your stomach, there's very little oxygen there. So they're not gonna, li they're not gonna grow a mother in your stomach, for example. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there, there may be other things that they're doing. Maybe those dead microbial cells are feeding the other microbes in there and somehow changing your microbiome in a positive way. So, you have to be very, very, very cautious with all the probiotic stuff that's thrown around. Yeah. Yes. Uh, person with the so mic. Yeah. What's the actual role of salt? So a lot of these uh, fermented foods are actually salted. Yeah. Is it both permissive and uh, also restrictive of what can grow in foods? Absolutely. So many of these foods, like kimchi, uh, not kombucha necessarily, but cheese, uh, salami, you add a lot of salt to them. Um, it's partly for flavor, but it's also to keep things that may be bad pathogenic microbes from growing. So a lot of our pathogens don't like high salt conditions, but the microbes we want to grow, like the lactic acid bacteria that produce that zip, um, they in fact can tolerate high salt conditions. So the role of salt really is um, to control what microbes are there. What we're finding though in the cheese is that it has sort of a secondary role. In some situations it seems to be bringing in particular microbes, maybe from the marine environment, 
um, that could play a role in the flavors of some of these cheeses. But it really is one of the sort of gatekeepers of the micro uh, microbiome. Yeah? Um, you mentioned that you use curds to inoculate for various experiments. Yeah. How do you control for like where, what cows they come from or what farms they came from, and does that even matter? Um, so in our big survey that I just zoomed through really, <coughs> excuse me, really quickly, we found that the type of milk didn't matter. So goat, cow, sheep didn't really matter for the microbial diversity that we noticed. To control in our little in vitro cheeses that we use, um, we actually buy a lot of the same cheese from the same cheesemaker all the time. And we look at the chemistry of that, and it's about the same. Um, so it's, it's not as consistent as a pure medium where you know every single nutrient that's there. Um, but it's, it's really actually pretty consistent across experiments. It's a great question. We have a giant freezer just of wheels of cheese that we call microbe food. Uh, it's a pain, actually. You have to freeze dry it. You have to grind it. Then you have to put it in agar. You have to get it in all those little wells. So it's actually a lot of work. Uh, everyone grumbles when we have to make cheese. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a great system for doing these kinds of experiments. Yeah. Then one, we take one more question. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So when you're talking about my microbiomes and terroir, um, you mentioned that there's uh, the replication of some of these microbiomes in different places. Then, do you think there is a the human component of artisanship that then? selects for certain type of um, uh, microbes that will end up replicating microbiomes? Absolutely. So it's not just that. I mean, from my world, it's all about the microbes, right? Everything, the humans, the cows, the grass, doesn't matter. But that's not true. Um, in fact, it does matter, right? So it matters when those microbes get there. It matters how much salt is added by the cheese maker. Um, but I'll tell you, so the thing I passed around tonight is really an interesting example. Um, so that is a, an example of every column there. If you notice, there are different colors as you looked at that plate. Those, micro, those columns had exactly the same microbes in them um, from different places, but look at how different it was, right? It, they actually ended up looking quite different. So every single column is exactly the same microbes, but one's from Vermont, one's from France, one's from Oregon, one's from Maine. Um, and so here, even in a very controlled environment without a human, they're looking different and behaving different. So like I said, we haven't killed microbial terroir. There's a lot more to understand about the nuances of these systems and how these microbiomes interact. Uh, thank you, Ben. Let's uh, give Ben a round of applause. This is what it feels like to do research. After a while, you think that there's probably a path down, or that if you take a flying leap, there's probably a parachute on you, or there's a boat at the bottom.